Hello, welcome to Scott's Odyssey. When traveling through northeastern Pennsylvania into the Schuylkill County and through the small towns of the coal crackers, you will come across monuments, plaques, and statues that give attribute to the horrors that took place in these parts during the late 1800s. Yes, I said horrors. It's important that we remember the bads that took place in our history correctly in order to know who the real heroes were during that time. For instance, this man on the gallows pole. See you in a minute. And I will die with my head held high for I fought for the men below. Those men who slave and sweat and die down in a black hell hole. Welcome back. If you've watched my videos before, thank you for your patronage. And if you're new to Scott's Odyssey, well, welcome aboard. So here we are in Mahanoy City, Pennsylvania, where there is a dedication to a man being hung on the gallows pole. But before we get into his story, let's go back in time and learn something about the people who were here during that time. For some odd reason, there's always talk about slavery and civil rights and women activists and equality that were being raged in the courts and on the steps of government buildings. But nobody ever talks about those people who had the biggest impact on the development of both the industrial and political landscape that makes the United States what it is today. No, instead, we call out like spoiled little children who never had their fanny whacked and cry things like inequality, reparations, racism, misgendering, all surrounding a concept that simply boils down to, you have something I want and I think it's not fair because I'm not willing to work for it. Well, there still are several cultures of humanity as the singular race that it is that have never cried out about the cultural appropriations, discrimination, and bad jokes that run rampant to this day. Those people would be the descendants of the first Irish immigrants to the United States. What? Their slavery in the States under the phrase indentured servant doesn't matter? The fact that they were considered of less worth than a black slave when it came to doing work is not something that is bad in your history book. You don't believe it's discrimination nor cultural appropriation when you eat your lucky charms? How about St. Patrick's Day when non-Irish decide to don their green, say slurs like patty, and drink themselves into a stupor because they're imitating the Irish American? Regardless of all of that, the history created by the Irish immigrant and the Irish American cannot be ignored nor forgotten, even when they were ruthlessly trodden or even killed without a second thought. That brings us back to Mahanoy City, a borough that is part of the heart of coal cracker territory. The crimes of the railroad, steel, and most importantly, the coal industries are by no means a secret. Many people historically herald the actions of robber barons who made our leap forward into the 20th century possible. But trust me when I say that these leaps forward did not come without the backs of men to stand on. Because of a lack of people willing to do hard or dangerous work back in the mid to late 1800s, a niche was created that opened doors for the Irish, who could not find work anywhere else. That work was the coal mines. Without getting into the localized scandals found within each and every county from eastern Pennsylvania to western Pennsylvania, nor the scandals from New York to Oklahoma, we're going to drill down to a time period when the mistreatment of the workers boiled into an explosion. From the 1860s and through the 1870s, there were a record number of recorded and rather mysterious deaths in Schuylkill County. Over 50 if you need to hear a number. Not too dissimilar to the 57 Irish who all mysteriously died back down in Duffy's Cut in the 1830s. The difference here is that most of these men were not of Irish descent or were Irish who had become fully Americanized. They were prominent men of the local towns, business owners, mine owners, and both bosses and managers of the mining facilities. Just a drop in the bucket compared to the hundreds bordering on thousands of Irish who lost their lives directly to mine collapses, mining working conditions, and the lack of pay most of the men received on a promise. 
Unlike the 1830s, this was the 1870s. These were the survivors of the Great Famine, or as we say in the States, the Potato Famine, which lasted between 1840s and the 1850s. These were the people who saw the worst and hardest times of landlordship and lack of food, immigrating to the United States for a much better chance of survival. Many of those who came over did so with links to groups and secret societies that learned how to lash back at the overlords and make conditions fair for the fair working person. These particular people were known as the White Boys, an agrarian group that used violence to level the tenant farmer sustainability rights. The Pipa Days Boys, or Orange Boys, who were a Protestant faction, similar to the White Boys, and then here in the States, we had the black-faced Molly Maguires. Yes, I said black face. Because the Mollies were known to blacken their face with burnt cork before coming to America, where they then donned the face of every single coal miner in the anthracite industry. Although the Working Men's Benevolent Association was formed in 1864 to help improve conditions for miners and enforce safer mining conditions, the Irish were often left out of the discussions and saw no change made for their plight. So shortly afterward, they created their own group known as the Ancient Order of Hibernians to fight legal disputes and argue for better working conditions. Unfortunately, like the work, Working Men's Benevolent Association, the work of the Ancient Order of Hibernians did not find much resolve in their efforts. So it is said because it is not recorded that out of the Ancient Order of Hibernians came the local chapters of the Molly Maguires. And once you were proved to be of the correct Irish descent, then you could be inducted into the Mollies to fulfill a change in conditions through force rather than rhetoric. The origin of the Molly Maguires is based on their namesake, Molly Maguire, the widow of a man killed back in Ireland by his landlord, and then Molly herself became the leader of the group that would gain vengeance on those who took tenancy to extremes. So the offshoot secret society to lurk in these parts of Pennsylvania was the Molly Maguires. Now, it's important to note what was different about the Mollies versus the other groups. First and foremost, they were mostly Catholics. During this time, the most hated of the Irish were those who were Catholics. It's also important to know that the Mollies were not localized agrarian types out of Ireland. No, these were the rural Gaelic and Celtic who had limited contact and could barely speak English. One last key note on the Molly Maguires is they did not take well to being treated unfairly or the mistreatment of their kin. Now to switch back over to the Industrial Revolution, it is most important to realize that it could only happen if you had power to run the machines. That power came from only one source during this time, and that was anthracite coal, the black gold of the 1800s and early into the 1900s. There was so much of it to go around, and it made so much money that what you were guaranteed to go with it was scandal and corruption from as high up as the robber baron to the positions of coal mining operators, politicians, police, and on some occasions, the local Catholic church. It was everywhere. Now, a lot of the coal miners were considered so worthless that when they died due to mining accidents, their families, if they were lucky, would receive a small stipend of the amount of money that was owed to the lost miner and then booted along their way. Lots of times the pay of the workers was held for weeks or even months in order to get them to work harder or because the corruption just worked its way that deep into the particular mining business. So as is the fashion with corruption comes the death of those who don't agree with the system or with the reparations. As would often happen, when you did not get paid or a fair reparation did not reach a family, then a manager, boss, or owner would end up dead. Of course, these types of deaths did not go without a response in which workers would end up dead at a later point due to purported accidents or some other non-official, if even reported, report. And as this particular site attests to, many were just strung up under allegation with no proper court or a corrupted courts making their determination as guilt worthy of death. Because of this unlawfulness, the ancient order of Hibernians usually acted on behalf of the accused and provided the legal services for those being charged in crimes. 
as far as secret organization goes, the basis of the Miley Maguires in northeastern Pennsylvania is always under historical review. First off, it was secret, so secret that it's not known to this day if it really even existed. It's often said that the ancient order of Hibernians was just a front for the Miley Maguires. It's also found that the Molly Maguires may have only existed as a figment of the coal industry's corrupt mentality in order to create a reason to stop unionization within the company. As I stated earlier, the problems got so bad and things began to boil over into what was referred to as the 1875 Long Strike. The Long Strike was an open coal dispute throughout the entire anthracite coal region which resulted in some of the most violent labor dispute related crimes in US history. Both sides of the anthracite industries, the coal companies and the unions, struck out violently toward each other in brawls, mine sabotage, and unfortunately, murder. There were even coal company police forces who were given permission to kill anyone who was on strike and became violent, historically referred to as the Pennsylvania Cossacks. It was so bad that a private military detective agency known as the Pinkertons brought in their native Irishman, James McParland, to investigate the ongoings of the long strike, to the point where he donned the name McKenna so that he could infiltrate the ancient order of Hibernians and prove out the Miley Maguires. Although there has never been any actual proof of a group of people acting collectively as the Molly Maguires, McKenna's witch hunt did find a handful of people in the ancient order of Hibernians who made claim to being a Molly, and with McKenna becoming a part of that group, over 60 men were taken into custody for potential links to the Molly Maguires, disrupting and shutting down the entire strike. Like the media does, although there was never any proof of the existence of the Molly Maguires, they continued to spew the name across their pages for every incident involving an Irishman. Trials began in 1875 and through 1877 regarding crimes committed by these Molly Maguires, and although there was no link to a true organization, each man ended up getting tried individually. The outcome was the sentencing of 19, or some say 20, men all to be hanged. I believe the confusion of the 19 men being 20 is because Daniel Kelly went by the alias Manus Cull and he counted them twice. Before their execution, all convicted men were formally excommunicated from the Catholic Church and denied a proper Christian burial. To sum up the reasons for the convictions is interesting. All men were convicted of murder in the first degree or accomplices of the murder for John P. Jones, often named Jack Jones. Benjamin F. Yost, a Tamaqua policeman killed in retaliation for an arrest. Morgan Powell, the Lehigh Coal Company superintendent. Thomas Sanger, the mine foreman of Heaton's Colliery, and William Urin, a potential witness to the Sanger murder. That brings us back to the statue of the man before the gallows pole. The statue was a publicly funded art piece created by Zenos Fudakis and named the Molly Maguire and revealed on a Remembrance Day in Mahanoy, now referred to as the Day of the Rope, a nod to those Irish of American who suffered a grave injustice on Thursday, June 21st of 1877, officially referred to by the state as Black Thursday and it would become the day of the second largest mass execution of any group of people by the U.S. federal government in history. The first being that of the 38 members of the Dakota tribe in Minnesota on December 26th of 1862. Out of the convicted men, six men were hanged at the prison located in Pottsville, where the number of people who came to honor these men at their time of hanging is recorded to have stretched as far as anyone could see. Four more were fit to be hanged at the Carbon County Jail in Mouse Chunk, now known as Jim Thorpe. Carbon County Judge John P. Lavelle stated that the Molly Maguire's trials were a surrender of state sovereignty. A private corporation initiated the investigation through a private detective agency. A private police force arrested the alleged offenders and private attorneys for the coal companies prosecuted them. The state provided only the courtroom and the gallows. The rest of the men would be hung over the course of the following two years, some because they were sick or infirm due to 
being brutally beaten at the scheduled time of execution. A second spy of the Pinkertons, known only as Kelly the Bum, held the role as to pretend to be one of the convicted of the Molly Maguires, only to give false testimony of their murders and crimes. He received no conviction, was rewarded $1,000 for his testimony, and told to leave the country. Before leaving his cell, Alex Campbell slammed his muddy hand into the wall of his cell, exclaiming, There! is my proof of words that mark of mine will never be wiped out. It will remain forever to shame the county for hanging an innocent man. And the handprint is still there in his cell to this day. Edward Kelly was quoted as stating, I would squeal in Jesus Christ to get out of here. In a 1979 court review, it was recognized by the state of Pennsylvania that the trial was full of inconclusive evidence, circumstantial at best, and that the witnesses were clearly refutable to the point of Pinkerton spy McParlin, who was accused of perjury and got off scot-free, would surely have been convicted. During that review, 101 years later, the state gave John Black Jack Kehoe, the alleged King of the Mollies and man who allegedly set up the murder of Frank W.S. Langdon, a full state pardon. If you would like to watch another video regarding the injustice brought against the Irish in America, check out this video here. As always, I thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.